All right, let's talk through this uh, Griffith's book. So we're going to start with this advertisement. Um, actually, no, I'm going to start at the preface, which says that this book um, is designed for uh, first uh, two semester courses. You could cover the whole thing in two semesters, or if you're just doing one semester, you can stop at chapter seven. So that's what we're going to plan to do. Um, and there's a couple of things he does here which are meaningless to you because you probably haven't studied other e &M textbooks, but he's just pointing out that there's going to be some ways that he uses notation um, to define the unit vector, uh, vectors which point in the x, y, and z directions. Um, he uses uh, this notation here. When doing cylindrical coordinates, um, the distance from the z-axis he defines as s. Okay, not a big deal. And then this cursive letter R, which is weird, um, and is apparently the Kaufman font in Microsoft Word, which is apparently how he uh, prepared this textbook. Um, it denotes the uh, vector, uh, the length uh, and orientation of the vector that connects one vector to another. So if you're, um, you know, you've got a charge sitting here at vector R prime, and you want to know what's the vector over here. Uh, you, you, if you want to know what the electric field is like out there at that vector, then what you care about is script R, because if you remember kq1, q2 over R squared, you want to know the distance here, and so the distance there is going to be the magnitude of that uh, uh, vector uh, script R. Okay, so that's script R is going to be the important thing, and these other two coordinates come about as a general uh, coordinate system. Okay, most of the time when you studied E and M, you had one charge and another charge, and you measured the distance r between them, and it was easy. Uh, now what we're going to do is go into an arbitrary coordinate system where your charge can be at an arbitrary point, and what you care about is this script r, which is the distance between them, and that is just if that's r prime and that's r. If I do the head-to-tail method, um, and switch that vector around so that it looks like that, and then move the head to the tail, boop, boop, then, um, oops, I just erased that vector, then script R is um, that result there, and so that's just how you can think about it. Okay, so anyway, um, there are problems in line with the text, and those uh, are going to be what we're going to do mostly in class, and those are the problems that are really the most important because they help you learn what the heck he's talking about, okay? Um, if things are, uh, he says challenging here, but usually that means they just uh, take a long time and they're a little bit more tedious with algebra. So you can kind of avoid those if you want, um, and they generally, you know, they're just a little trickier. So we will probably not deal with many of those. Um, and then goes on to the advertisement, talks about all the different types of mechanics, classical, quantum, special relativity, and then quantum field theory, which is quantum mechanics with special relativity added to it. Um, and it goes through the, the history here. There's the four fundamental forces, as you are aware, the strong, electro electromagnetic, weak, and gravitational. And remember, strong forces uh, are the interquark forces that uh, uh, the exchange of gluons inside the uh, protons and neutrons, which hold the quarks together. Um, weak forces are responsible for neutrino physics and radioactive decay. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, he goes through that and says, okay, we're trying to unify these all these um, theories. We've got electricity, which was unified with magnetism to become electricity and magnetism, and then it became the electroweak theory when uh, uh, electricity, magnetism, and the weak force were combined in the 1960s um, to become uh, uh, quantum uh, electrodynamics, QED, and then we have quantum chromodynamics, QCD, which governs the behavior of quarks and tries to predict how those uh, behave and become particles like protons and neutrons and pions and kaons and other things like that. And then uh, now we have this uh, electrodynamics as a field theory, uh, and um, that's kind of where we're at today. So we're going to treat electricity and magnetism as called like a classical field theory. Uh, and we're going to learn just the basics of the mathematics that go into that. Um, and electric charge is the main uh, topic that we're going to be talking about and how it behaves and the different things you can do with it. So there's two types of charge, uh, plus and minus. That's it. 
in quarks with color charge, there's three colors of charge or three types of charge. So there's no reason that there should be plus and minus charges. It could be plus and minus and something else and who knows what, right? Um, but uh, we have only two, plus and minus, so that's cool. Charge is always conserved. You're always going to have, you know, when you transform something into something, charge is conserved from before and after. We haven't seen any examples of that being uh, wrong. So, you know, if you find something like that, uh, let me know, and I will take credit for it and win the Nobel Prize. Uh, just don't tweet about it, because then people will get mad at me. All right, um, charge is always conserved. So we're going to talk about this, the continuity equation um, that we get to later in the course. A charge is quantized. So um, the fundamental unit of charge is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. That's the charge of an electron or the charge of a proton. That is the most fundamental charge. So you never have um, 2.3 uh, electron charges, right? It's always in units of E, okay? So that's pretty cool. Um, and then the units, this is the last kind of weird thing. There's three types of units that people use for electromagnetism, Gaussian, SI, and Heaviside Lorentz. And you can see Coulomb's law in either of these things. The units um, in Gaussian, there's no units. It's just QQ over R squared. In SI units, it's QQ over this epsilon naught comes in with a 4 pi. In Heaviside Lorentz, it's QQ over 4 pi. Um, and the two most popular are Gaussian and uh, SI. And then this heavy side Lorentz people use, and it just really has to do with um, when you're doing the calculations, what has the least amount of steps writing in the context you're writing in. Um, so uh, we're going to use SI units, um, which are your standard uh, centimeters, meters, seconds, and so on, um, kilograms. Okay, um, and then there's appendix C that has a dictionary for converting units. All right, moving on to chapter one. So we're going to start talking about vector uh, analysis, and we're starting with uh, section 1.1, which is what this video is going to cover. And 1.1 is just introducing the concept of the vector and what you can do with it. You can add and subtract. We've done vector stuff. You've done vector stuff, but never like this before. Okay, so let's review. Um, if you walk four miles and then three miles, okay, you, are, you walked seven miles, okay? But you're not... Uh, seven miles from where you started, okay? So how do we describe that? And that's where the concept of the vector comes in because we need magnitude and direction. Magnitude and direction. Those two things together are what a vector makes um, uh, or what makes a vector. Um, so we call these things uh, with a bolded um, typeface a vector, okay? And the magnitude of it is the absolute value symbol here. Um, or an unbolded A. So if you see an unbolded A, it means the magnitude. So if I asked you, if I said that this is vector A, okay, and I would draw it with an arrow on top, and that's probably what you're most used to, but in this book, it's easy to bold it, just bold it, and so that becomes a vector. So let's say this is a very uh, bolded A. Okay, so there's my vector. If I said, okay, what's the magnitude? Psh, psh, I could put that on there and say the magnitude of A is four miles, okay? So that's just some notation stuff. Um, if you talk about a vector and you want to talk about the opposite of the vector, all you have to do is mirror it or flip it around. So uh, there's the axis perpendicular to it and then just cause it to flip the other way. Um, so uh, there are four main operations that you can do to a vector. You can add vectors together and you can multiply vectors in three different ways. Uh, the addition of two vectors is simple. You do the head-to-tail method. So if this is A and that's B, and we had them separated, so there's A and then B's over here. If I wanted to add those two vectors, I would join those two points together. So I would move this vector up here. And now A plus B gives me that vector. And so this is A plus B, okay? And that's what this is showing you here. We have vector A and we have vector B. And that vector is the result of A plus B. And so if you said, I walked this far in that direction, this far, this far in that direction, and then uh, I want to know how far away you were from where I started, boom, that's that vector. And it'll tell you exactly how far away you are from where you started if you wanted to walk straight back to it. Okay, and subtract vectors, the same thing. If this is A, and let's say B is this way, but you subtract B, you have it go backwards, and then A minus B is that result there, okay? 
so that's, you can add vectors together. And all you do is place the tail at the head of uh, the vector. Okay, it's commutative, so a plus b equals b plus a. It's associative, so you could do a plus b and then add c, or you could do b plus c and then add a, doesn't matter. Same thing with subtraction. Okay, then you can multiply a vector by a constant, a scalar, a number, and it is distributive, it goes through it, but all you do is multiply, and when you multiply a scalar to a vector, it just shortens or lengthens the vector. It doesn't change its direction, it just lengthens or shortens it. Okay, uh, this is an example. If your vector is a, you multiply it by two, the vector just gets longer. Okay, your arrow just gets longer, twice as long. Okay, so, um, you know, if your force is a, and then you apply twice as much force, then your vector becomes twice as long. Now, there's three ways to multiply. We did our associative scalar property. Um, uh, and now we're going to do our, uh, sorry, our distributive scalar property. And then uh, there's the dot product. And a, a dotted into B gives you um, the projection of A along B and then multiply by that. So, you know, think about it this way. If you have a vector uh, A and you have a vector B, okay, and then you know there's the uh, force Q, V, uh, cross B, which is a bad example for cr uh, the uh, dot product because this is the cross product. Um, so let me find a different example. I'll do that one in a little bit. Okay, but let's say you have got A and you've got B here, those two vectors. Um, a dot B is defined as the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them. Okay, and what this says is that if I have a vector A and a vector B and there's an angle here, if I have a physics formula where um, the length of A, there's my Y component of A up, and then my uh, X component of A is this way. Let's say my physics that I'm doing depends on AX times B, okay, but the AY component doesn't do anything. That's what the dot product is there for, because what the dot product does is take the adjacent and hypotenuse, right? So it takes the adjacent side of A, multiplies that times B, the length of B, the magnitude of B, so that those two work together. If the x component of A and B all work together um, to multiply two things, then you have um, a, a dot product, okay? So that's all that is. It's just A, B, cosine, theta, and that's where you want to ignore the y component that's perpendicular to the uh, uh, vector because if you have A and B at 90 degree angles, cosine of 90 uh, is 0, so then you have zero uh, result of those two forces acting together or whatever they, they're representing. Okay, and then the scalar product um, or the dot product is commutative. So you could do A dot B or you could do B dot A. And again, that's because all you're doing is multiplying the uh, coordinates that are along each other. And it's distributive, so you could A, A dot B plus C. So you could do A dot B and then add A dot C. And you can prove that pretty straightforward. Um, so what a dot b is, is the product, a product of a times the projection of b along a, or the product of b times the projection of a along b. Okay, the, you can think of the dot product as either way, because it's a b cosine theta. It's not telling you, the, you know, which one's cosine um, is being, it's not a cosine theta times b or b cosine theta times a. It's either one of those, um, and that's how you can think about it. So a dot b, if the two vectors are parallel in a row, then you just have a, b. Uh, if you have any vector dotted into itself, you just get its magnitude squared. If they are perpendicular to each other, a dot b equals zero. Okay, so this is if you have two vectors, a and b. Um, a cosine theta, right? Um, if we look at what cosine theta is, cosine theta is equal to, <clears throat> excuse me, of that angle, we've got um, adjacent a x over hypotenuse a uh, cosine theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse a x over a so then a cosine theta is equal to a x so then um, a dot b is equal to a cosine theta right times magnitude of b and so that's where that comes from so you're taking the x component of a uh, times the b b component or whatever Okay, and that's the B component with the magnitude of B. 
So that's what you're doing there. If you care about, you know, if this force, if the y component is doing nothing, but the x component is adding to b to give you an even longer vector, or they're working together where they multiply, um, like a force times distance type thing, then, uh, then you want to take that dot product. Okay, so here's an example. Um, let's uh, c equals a minus b, which is figure 1.7. So there's a um, and there's b, and then c is going to be a minus b, uh, and that gives you what the c vector, uh, c vector is. And it says calculate the dot product of c with itself. Okay, so we're saying c dot c is equal to a minus b, and so then we replace each c with a minus b. And so a minus b dotted a minus b is equal to a dot a minus a dot b minus b dot a plus b dot b. And then you get a dot a is a squared, b dot b is b squared, um, and then you have two times, because a dot b is just a b cosine theta, same thing, a b cosine theta, so you have minus two a b cosine theta, and that is what's called the law of cosines. Okay, and the law of cosines um, is a kind of standard formula uh, that is uh, pretty cool. Okay, so, um, uh, which is just, you know, the area, or not the area, but, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so, um, blah, 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 the sides of a triangle for any non-right triangle. Okay, um, cross product. That's, so, we've got three ways to multiply vectors. One, just multiply a number on all of them. Uh, so that's scalar multiplication. Um, or you can uh, have a dot product, and the third one is called a cross product, and that's written like this, a cross b, and the result is a b sine theta. Um, the important thing is that the uh, uh, cross product results in another vector. So the um, dot product results in a scalar. a b cosine theta is just a number, okay? The cross product results in a third vector. And if you remember the right-hand rule, a right-hand rule, um, which one? The one where you make a X, Y, Z coordinate system. So it looks like you're doing some kind of crazy gang sign or something. If you do that, um, and you point your finger in, uh, actually point your, yeah, finger in, just point your finger at something, stick your middle finger 90 degrees apart from that, and then your thumb perpendicular to both of those. So now you've got an X, Y, Z coordinate system with your fingers. Um, if you do X cross Y, Okay, where you imagine your index finger is the x coordinate and the y coordinate is your middle finger. If you want to know what x cross y gives you, it gives you the z direction. You, so your thumb is the resultant of a cross uh, of x cross y. Okay, x cross y is z. Okay, so this is a weird thing, but this is an example of the um, like I was doing earlier, q v cross b, where you're trying to figure out. Okay, if I put my finger in the velocity direction of a particle in a magnetic field, and then the B is this direction with my middle finger, and then the force is perpendicular, so it causes my particle to turn. Um, and how are you trying to figure that out? Because you're doing the cross product. So this is going to be, the V is going to be in some coordinate system like I hat. The B coordinate vector is going to be pointed in the J hat like Y. And so your force, the result of V cross B is going to be uh, the force, um, in uh, the n hat direction or what would be the k hat direction, okay? So uh, that's what the cross product is uh, all about. All right, so n is this unit vector that's just pointed in the result uh, of the perpendicular to, to the two areas. So this is describing that right-hand rule again. So a cross b points into the page, b cross a points out of the page, and that's what a right-handed coordinate system is by definition. It's distributive, so you can do A cross B plus C means you can do A cross B and then plus A cross C, uh, but it's not commutative, so this is a really important thing. B cross A does not automatically mean minus A cross B, okay? So that's not always the case. So when you're trying to simplify some of your math, you don't want to do this uh, because you might uh, get stuck somewhere. Okay, A cross A is zero, so you can't uh, cross product with itself, doesn't make sense. Um, but a cross b, if you think about what it is, the result is the area of this parallelogram. And then the magnitude of that becomes a vector that's pointed perpendicular to a cross b. Okay, to the, the, So this a and this b, they span this area. They create a flat plane. And then a cross b, the result of that is 
a new vector that has the magnitude equal to this area, but it's pointed in a direction perpendicular to the plane that the a and b vectors uh, produce. So that's what the cross product is. Um, and we got a couple problems here to work through. Okay, so when we talked about these vectors addition uh, and multiplication, we did kind of hand wavy arguments and, and head to tail and whatever. But let's say you actually wanted to calculate something. Um, so in order to do that, we have to break these vectors into their components. And it's not crazy, you've done this before. Um, the components are just the length of the vector along each of the coordinate systems. So we've got our unit vectors, x, y, and z hat, which just allow us to assign a direction to a component of a vector. Um, and these are called the basis vectors. And if you have a vector pointing off into some space, we define a coordinate system. There it is, x, y, z, totally arbitrary. You can expand any vector a. Keep in mind, the vector a is itself its own thing. It becomes something in a coordinate system once you define the coordinate system, but does not def affect the actual vector. It only changes the components. Okay, so the basis vectors, um, x, y, z, allow you to say, if this is my vector and it has um, this component is up in the z, there's your y, there's your x. So we've got uh, this amount or that amount in the x direction. So it'd be, I could write this vector a as, um, let's say, I don't know, three, i hat plus 4 j hat plus uh, 5 k hat and this is a way to represent that the vector goes if i was going to draw that vector i would say okay here's my prescription here's my recipe 3i three, 3 4 so i'm going to go 3 in the i hat which is x hat same thing uh, 4 in the j hat which is the y and then 5 up into the z hat boom and there's there's my vector now Okay, so that's how you could decompose a vector or expand a vector into its basis, okay, using that. So there's your x, y, z, um, those are your components. So this is really important. So we can write a vector a, we can expand it in an arbitrary coordinate system, but whatever coordinate system we choose, the components a, x, a, y, and a, z, um, those are the magnitudes now, and then x hat become the directions. Okay, so that's how we draw a component. So if we want to add two vectors together, a plus b, we don't now have to do the head-to-tail method. We can expand a and b into their component notations. a and b now become these whole things. If you want to know what a plus b is, you just add the components that are like ax plus bx. Add them those two numbers together. That'll be a number, 1 and 2 or something. Those add together, the result is pointed in the x direction. These add together, the result is pointed are pointing in the y direction. These add together, they're pointing in the z direction. So now we can take two vectors, a and b, and rather than doing this, um, which is taking the x component of a and the x component of b, so there's the x component of a, there's the x component of b, we add that, plus that gives us a new x component, the y component of a, the y component of b, add those two together, bing, bing, and so our new vector, there's the x component, the y component, our new vector, boop, is up. Uh, there. Wow, that was stupid, wasn't it? Um, because my b doesn't have a y uh, component. So uh, there we go. So there's our x component. Our y component is just there. And then no x component from the y, uh, no y component from the b. And so our new vector becomes that, okay? Um, so you can do that by adding those components together. And that's how you would, on a practical level, actually add two vectors together is break it up into its components in the coordinate system you're working in, and then add the components together, and then you get a new vector. So to add vectors, you add the like components, which are the x coordinates. coordinates. You can multiply by a scalar. a times a is just, again, multiply that through the whole thing. Um, x, y, and z are mutually per perpendicular. So x dot x, y dot y, z dot z, that all gives you one, but x dot y, x dot z and y dot z, all the perpendicular ones give you zero to each other. So then a dot b, um, if you're going to do the dot product, um, just gives you ax bx plus a y b y plus a z b z. So that becomes really easy when you do the dot product. And you should, when you do the dot product of two vectors, um, you can work that out and do a dot b and then you end up with all the, all the different a x hat times b x hat, that's this one, but then x dot x gives you one. If you did ax 
times by, x dot y gives you zero, so that disappears. So that's why the only things that survive are the like components again. Um, another a dot a rule, uh, if you want to know the length of a vector, you take its dot product with itself and you get ax squared plus ay squared plus az squared, which is the Pythagorean theorem you'll recognize. Um, so the magnitude of any vector is the uh, dot product of itself in the coordinate system it is. If you've got a four-dimensional vector, six-dimensional, 12, 11-dimensional vector, you can find the length of it using a fancy Pythagorean theorem, which is just each component squared plus squared plus squared plus squared and so on. Um, that's the generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so now we have cross product stuff here, and there's some rules about cross products. Remember that a, a, a vector cross with itself is zero, so that's a useful identity. Um, remember that x cross y gives you minus y cross x. It doesn't give you, this, it's not the same. Um, and the result of x cross y is the perpendicular axis z. The result of y cross z is the perpendicular axis to those x, and z cross x is y. Okay, so those are interesting things, and this is what a right-handed coordinate system is, where x is out of the page, y is to the right, and z is up, or whatever. Okay, so if you do a cross b, and then you write the vectors out in component form, and then you actually do the multiplication, uh, then you get this AYBZ minus AZBY times X hat plus blah, 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 and all these things. This is something even I always have to write down and look up again or uh, do this thing again to remember what it is because I don't use it enough to really have it completely memorized to make sure. Actually, I probably do. That's probably a lie. Okay, but anyway, it's complicated, so don't worry about it. The A cross B is the determinant of this matrix, X, Y, Z, a, X, A, Y, A, Z, B, X, B, Y, B, Z. So you write the um, unit vectors in the first row. You write the uh, uh, components of the first vector in the second row, and then you write the components of the third vector in the last row. And you remember that um, the uh, determinant is you take this and then A, Y times B, Z minus B, Y times A, Z. Uh, oops. And that's what this... Uh, part is, and then you move to the next one, y hat times a, z, b, x, a, x, b, z, and so on, da, 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 da. and that's how you can uh, do that. I don't know what this is. New note. Okay. Um, so to calculate the cross product, you form the determinant of this thing. So uh, maybe you don't know what a determinant is. Uh, we can go over that. Um, but the determinant of this is this. So that's the determinant of that three-dimensional matrix. Okay, um, so if you're wondering what it is, that's it. That's all it is. Um, okay, so here's an example here. Find the angle between the faces, uh, face diagonals of a cube. So there's one vector. Here's another vector. Those are the coordinates of the vectors there. Um, 0, 1, 0, and then 1, 0, 0. Well, those are your x's. So in component form, if you want to do a dot b, Okay, and um, you know, write everything down. Um, you know, blah 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 blah. Let's see. Yeah, so this is interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, let's keep going. So go through that example. I like that. Uh, this is trying to show you the two different ways you can do the um, a dot b's, um, either in the uh, abstract form, which is a b cosine theta, you know that 2 cosine theta has to equal 1 um, because you can do a dot b in two different ways. So 2 cosine theta equals 1, so that means cosine theta equals 1 half, which means the angle between them is uh, 60 degrees, which is kind of cool. So read through that, uh, make sure you understand that. Um, triple products are when you have, um, uh, it's called a scalar triple product, that's a dotted into b cross c. So why do we teach you these things? It's because they show up from time to time as we go through the book in real uh, ways in calculating actual things like uh, um, you, you know, you've got electromagnetic field or something like that or electric field acting on a charge and then you're going to do something to it. You're going to want to do a dot into the result of the electric field acting and then you get different answers. So um, uh, there's some rules here. A dotted into B cross C is equal to B dotted into C cross A is equal to C dotted into A cross B. That's pretty cool, okay? They all correspond to the same figure because of this, uh, what the geometry is. Um, 
the thing that you pay attention to is that alphabetical order is preserved. So it's A, B, C, A, B, C, or A, B, C. Okay, when it, wherever the A is, B follows. Wherever B is, C follows, and, and it goes around in circles. Okay, um, non-alphabetical alphabetical triple products have the opposite sign. So if you go A, and then you have to go backwards, A, B, C, A, B, C, and A, B, C, backwards, um, then you get a minus sign. Okay, um, so then here's your A dotted into B cross C. It's the same thing, your determinant of this matrix, but instead of unit vectors, now you have AX, AY, and AZ instead of just X hat, Y hat, and so on. So you have the same uh, result. Uh, you can replace this instead of X hat, Y hat, and Z hat. You can put the magnitudes A, X, A, Y, and A, Z if you're doing A, B, C like that. Okay, and then... Uh, you get this result here, A dotted into B cross C is equal to A cross B dotted into C. These are things that you will probably have to continuously look up uh, before you get a really good sense uh, or a handle on um, what the identities are and what these rules are. So don't be afraid of that. Um, they're in the back of the book in the inside cover. Well, I recommend if you're using the PDF to print that page off from the back uh, just to always have those identities handy. Okay, um, blah, blah, blah. And then, yeah, so A dotted B cross C is meaningless because you can't make a cross product of a scalar, which is what A dot B is, and a vector. Okay, so that's interesting. Then you have the vector triple product because now instead of a scalar multiplied by the two things, we have three vectors, A cross B cross C. Triple product um, can be defined, and so this is something you don't ever want to do. You never want to do that because it's a real pain in the butt, okay? So what you use is this back cab rule. So anytime you see A cross B cross C, you can simplify it into B times A dot C minus C times A dot B. Okay, so that's just back cab, B, A, C, C, A, B. Back minus cab, back minus cab, B, A, C. B, A, C, minus C, A, B, back minus cab. Cool, you got it? All right, so um, uh, yeah, there's, these other rules that you can do, we don't usually do those because they get a little bit crazy. So this problem here, prove the back cab rule by writing out both sides in component form. So you'll probably have to do that. Um, I mean, you will have to do that. And then there's this proof, this stuff here. And again, that's just writing out a bunch of algebra and just showing that it works and understanding how the machinery um, goes. All right, 1.1.4. Position and separation vectors. Let's say you have an origin here and a point here. The vector connecting them um, is R, we'll call it, um, and it's pointed in the R hat direction. The R hat direction is just the unit vector representing uh, the direction that R is. So you could multiply the magnitude of R times R hat. Um, this vector R has components X, Y, and Z. X, Y, and Z. Okay, and uh, each of those components are written this way to show you how far in X, how far in Y, and how far in Z. And let's say you have a field and you say, oh, I wanna measure what the field is like out here. Well, you know that the distance between them is what you care about, and that is called this uh, script R. Okay, and that script R is the uh, uh, separation vector which separates those two points. Okay, so um, R, is the position vector, uh, bold r like that. r, the length of it is square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, just like normal. Um, the magnitude and its distance uh, is the distance from the origin, right? Um, and then this r hat vector is um, the magnitude of r divided by the length of r, not the magnitude of r, the vector r divided by its magnitude, because so it's like a normalized vector. It's pointed in the r hat direction, um, and it's uh, got these components in the x, y, and z, but they are um, normalized so that uh, you're dividing by the length of the vector. So that's it's telling you what percentage of the vector is in x, y, and z, but dividing by its length so that it normalizes out, okay? Um, the displacement vector is just this little dl. Let's say we want to um, move from the 
point the end of the point just a little bit, a little bit in the X, a little bit in the Y, a little bit in the Z. We're going to do this later with our calculus stuff, um, but that's called the displacement vector. Okay, um, he's saying you could call it dr because you're just trying to move. That's your vector. You're just trying to move it just a little bit over um, just to see what happens. Um, but uh, he calls it dl just for simplicity. Okay, so you frequently encounter a source point, r prime, and a field point, r. And what you want to do is calculate the effect of the field at the uh, field point from the source point. And uh, you're going to use this separation vector, which is just the, se you know, r minus r gives you this vector. It's the distance between them, and it's the subtraction of the two vectors. Okay, and um, it's very simple. It sounds complicated, but it's not. The magnitude of it is the magnitude of r minus r. Yeah, thanks, Griffiths. Um, but if you were going to actually do that, um, you just, again, simply subtract the components r minus r hat, or r prime here. That would be rx minus rx prime, and then ry minus ry prime, and rz minus rz prime. And um, that'll give you the magnitude of... Uh, the vector, the, so it's the magnitude of these two things together. So you subtract each of the components, uh, rx minus r prime x, ry minus r y prime, rz minus rz prime. That gives you a new vector. The new vector x squared plus y squared plus z squared, square root of that would give you the uh, uh, the length, the magnitude. Okay, so there's a lot in this thing. Make sure you understand what that is saying. There's a lot going on there, okay? Um, so this is showing you how to calculate um, the magnitude. So this magnitude here is, that's what I was just trying to explain to you, x minus x prime squared, y minus y prime squared, z minus z prime squared, square root of all that, uh, because that's what that uh, vector is, okay? And then you got a unit vector, you're doing the same thing. It's vector divided by its magnitude, um, and that normalizes, a, uh, gives you something to point somewhere. Um, and then you can multiply it by anything um, because all, all it's doing is allowing you to tell what direction something is point, pointing. It gets rid of the magnitude of it. Okay, um, so then there's this last section here, which is how vectors transform, which is really important. Um, so if you have a vector here in this coordinate system, but now you want to say, oh, actually my coordinate system is a little bit rotated. What does the vector look like now? And the vector itself does not change. The vector a here, just because you take your coordinate system and you rotate it, okay, does not mean a changes. What changes are the components of a. So a is always a. The components are changing if you change the coordinate system. And uh, the coordinate system changing gives you these um, simple formulas here, which if you just do the geometry, and if this is a, y in this coordinate system, and now that's a, y in the other coordinate system, what's the difference between them? Uh, you end up with this transformation transformation matrix, um, which I definitely recommend you go through and just you know figure out this algebra again. It's just using these angles here and uh, and then saying that's a y in this coordinate system. This is a y in that coordinate system. How are they related to each other? Okay, and uh, they're related to each other with this um, coordinate system. So this math here, how this works, these are matrices. So you do cosine theta times ay plus sine phi uh, times az. So this would be cosine theta times ay plus sine, sine phi times az. And that's what ay, the new ay, is equal to. And then the new az is equal to minus sine phi, sine phi, uh, this times ay and that times a y, and then plus cosine phi times a uh, z. And so that's what this um, is, this result, and that result, cosine theta, uh, sorry, did I say plus? Cosine theta a y, uh, cosine theta, yeah, it simplifies down. Okay, so now more generally about an arbitrary axis in three dimensions, you get this gigantic rotation matrix, this is what all your three-dimensional games are calculating um, when you're trying to uh, um, uh, shoot aliens or something like that. Every time you rotate your camera, it's doing these calculations to calculate all those rotations. All right, um, then we talk about uh, tensors. 
So you have a scalar, which is a number like two, a vector, which is like two, three, and then you have a matrix, which is like two, two, three, four, and then you have um, something that's like a matrix, two, two, three, four, but then you can imagine things behind it, like a six, seven, two, one, and then things in front of it, like nine, 15, 16, 17. Okay, so it's like a three-dimensional matrix, um, uh, a grid of numbers, a, a cube of numbers um, in three dimensions. So these are what tensors are. They're, you're generalizing X, Y, Z components, and then you get these other crazy things in three dimensions. So anyway, you don't have to worry about that yet. Tensors are cool. You should know them. Don't be afraid of them, but we're not going to deal with them uh, right now. Okay, that gets us to 1.2. See you guys later.